Guys, this is Mark Goldberg from Mark Vlogs Watches. I want to welcome you to my channel. And I'm afraid I might have a video here today that is going to upset some of you. So I want to apologize in advance if this is the case. Please understand, I am not trying to personally attack anybody whatsoever for your beliefs, your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions. This is a complicated hobby. Some of us have a lot of feelings wrapped up in our watches. It's a whole lot more than just a timepiece. But I am getting a little bit ahead of myself. So first, I think we should get through the quick fist watch check. But before we do that, I would like to quickly ask you to please subscribe to my channel if you have not already done so. And if you are currently a subscriber, I want to thank you so much for being with me. And now here it is, quick fist watch check. And guys, today I am wearing a Rolex, of course. And in fact, I'm wearing what has quickly become one of my very favorite Rolexes, the Rolex Submariner. Now to you guys, that might seem like, you know, the Joe Average Rolex. I mean, it's pretty much the first Rolex I think that most people get. Um, but for me, it was kind of like the last. I think I, I resisted the lure of the 40 millimeter Rolex for the larger watches. Um, and so I wound up with a James Cameron and a, and a, a 43 millimeter Sea Dweller and even a 42 millimeter Polar Explorer, which I happen to have right here. Um, so I wound up with this, oh, sorry, all this glare. Rolex, could you please start putting, see if you probably see it a little better back here. Please start putting some anti-glare reflective coating on your watches. Anyway, Rolex, that's of course gonna be the topic of our conversation. and. Listen, guys, like you, undoubtedly, I watch a whole lot of videos, and I'm also a member of a variety of watch groups on Facebook. And I remember a time when we mostly concerned ourselves with questioning which model we should get, talking about owner experiences, discussing how much we loved our various watches, getting into tiny little details uh, about each watch, like how the bezel of this one was better or different than the bezel of that one. A discussion of, um, oh, can I get this to focus? God. A discussion of, hang on, let me turn off this light. This is all new to me. Let's, let's get the light off and we'll come back at this. Yeah, it's just so much extra glare from that light. Okay, so a discussion of how this watch is terrific, except for some people hate that orange hand, so light goes back on. Yeah. I don't know. We, watch guys are a little crazy, which is why we have sort of nicknamed ourselves Watch Nuts, because we are a little bit nutty. But you know, over the last six or eight months, what I have noticed is an increasingly disturbing emotional trend, and that is in the various Facebook Rolex groups and forums, I am reading more and more, you know, basically f Rolex uh, type, of, um, type of posts. People are angry at the brand. They're angry at the authorized dealer. They're angry at flippers. They're angry at the gray market. There's a whole lot of anger, you know, flying around this brand that on some level or another, I feel like we love so well. Now, I can tell you in my own personal journey uh, as a dog trainer, one thing I have noticed is that, you know, sometimes people are trying to buy an expensive service for me. So for example, one of the things that I do is board and train. So your dog can come here to my boarding school and it can, your, your dog can stay with me for several weeks and learn all kinds of amazing things that you never thought your dog could ever learn. And then I'll teach you how to keep that going at home. And if you're anywhere in the Midwestern area, well, you know, you should get a hold of me and we could talk about your dog. But I digress. Um, the, the point that I wanted to make is, what I've noticed is that some people um, are not prepared for the amount of money that that, that that costs. And understandably so, boarding training is a lot more expensive than, than lessons or classes, as an example. And, and as you know, just in my own personal business for that reason, I have uh, a lot of services that are very economical. Um, in fact, I do 
telephone consults. So if you've got some kind of weirdo dog tr training, dog behavior problem, I do telephone and video chat consults all over the world. So, you know, you can uh, write me at markgoldberg8 at gmail.com and, you know, I can give you the particulars about that. It doesn't matter where you are. I can help you with your dog. Again, I digress. But what I want, what I'm trying to get to is, is that I have noticed in, in my business career that the people who get angry about the cost are actually the people who want it the most. It's just a weird psychological reaction. You know, if I walk into a store and I pick up something and I look at the price and I'm like, holy cow, you know, you know that is not, that, that's, I'm, I'm not buying this thing. You know, I don't slam it down, I'm not angry. Um, even if I kind of really wanted it. But what I've noticed is there are certain people who it kind of brings out some anger in them because they feel like they really want it, they've mentally invested in it, then when they find out what it costs, uh, you know, it upsets them. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I think that may correlate into the psychological, emotional disturbances that is hitting our community. I think many of you, not all of you, but I think many of you are really angry at Rolex. Um, and if you're in that category, I would like you to really hear me out on this topic before you just hit the thumbs down button on this video. Because I'm not trying to denigrate or downgrade your feelings. I, I don't think you're unimportant. I think you have a point, but I want to offer some alternative points of view related to a feeling towards a brand, okay? So uh, just hear me out a little bit. The first thing I'm going to say is that Rolex, we, we really have to separate out who is Rolex because there is this giant cloud around the topic of, you know, who, who is this watch, who produces it, who sells it, etc. So let's start first. Rolex is a, a company, a manufacturing company based in Geneva, Switzerland. The, Rolex, the manufacturer, is the are the, the guys who actually manufacture these watches is mass produced largely robotically they've got probably a trillion dollars worth of equipment the quality is excellent um, but they are built largely by machine so we have rolex the manufacturer now many manufacturers uh, are privately held i, I want to say patek is uh, privately held by the stern family um, other manufacturers are owned by a, a investment groups. We have Breitling, which is owned by a, a an investment banker group, essentially. Then we have other brands like Blancpain, um, which are owned by groups such as the Swatch Group or the Richemont Group, depending on the brand. And depending on those groups, a lot of those groups are publicly held companies. So they have shareholders, they have investors, they are required to put out um, annual uh, and quarterly financial statements and so forth. Rolex, the manufacturer in Switzerland, is actually held in charitable trust. It's a, it's a very, very odd arrangement for a company. It is not uh, a publicly held company and it's not even a privately held family owned company. It's a charitable foundation. Now that's because the founder of Rolex, Hans Wilsdorf, le Hans Wilsdorf <laughs> left it that way as a charitable trust. Now I, I haven't gone to Wikipedia to find out if he died with no children or why he did that. Um, but you know, have a look if you'd like. Just trust me on this one. Rolex is not a for-profit company. It's a charitable foundation. Now they're also based in Switzerland and they have different rules than we do in the United States. Here in the United States of America, charitable foundations have non-profit tax exempt status, but they're required to file all kinds of paperwork with the government to continually support their non-profit status. And what that means is a lot of their financial information is publicly available. Well, I am no expert in international law, but it is very well known that Switzerland is a country with banking and business laws that are very favorable towards secrecy. And so there is very, very little known in terms of what Rolex does with its profits, what its, what its economics and strategies are, very little known. So they're well incorporated as a charitable foundation in Switzerland, and this means you aren't going to know anything about what they do. Now, who sells Rolex? There are really um, several kinds of outlets who sell Rolex. The first and probably most common are relatively small independent jewelry stores. Those are known as authorized dealers who have a distribution contract with Rolex. Now, typically these are fairly small businesses, uh, family owned usually. They may have one, two, three locations, let's say. 
uh, but lots of them have one location. In the distribution contract, which they have with Rolex, they are guaranteeing and pledging to meet all sorts of really draconian requirements, very expensive requirements that Rolex has put upon them. For example, they must have an advertising budget. They have to uh, put full page ads in certain newspapers, magazines or they can put that budget into billboards. There's a, an authorized dealer not terribly far from me. I pass their billboard on I-90 on my way to O'Hare Airport with regularity. And that's a, on a, it's a giant billboard on a very well-traveled interstate highway. I'm pretty sure you're looking at about a $25,000 per month contract for that billboard. So these guys have got to put out tremendous amounts of money in order to support the Rolex brand. They're required to do that by Rolex. And these requirements go down to how much square footage they're going to offer Rolex. Usually it's got to be 40% of the store square footage. And the if you go into an authorized dealer, you'll notice that the Rolex cases are always in the front of the store. And maybe Omega and Breitling are, if they have those, are in the back of the store. And that's where you find the diamond and gold jewelry more to the back of the store. I mean, all of that stuff is governed by the Rolex distribution contract. Um, I actually feel for the Rolex authorized distributor. Look, I know there are some of them are probably doing some shenanigans and making it difficult for you to acquire what you want when they do have it. But believe me, I think the average authorized dealer, the AD, would be an awful lot happier if their supply from Rolex was much better because they make money selling watches and they really would like to sell as many of the Hulks and Daytonas as they possibly could. Um, I think a lot of them suffer. Uh, economically because they're only receiving a very small number of those and in the meantime Rolex forces them to buy all these date justs and gold and diamond pieces and stuff that they find much more difficult to sell so if there's a shenanigan here or there that's on a case-by-case -case individual basis it's definitely not all of them and um, some of them are probably even risking their contract in order to do it so when we when we start talking smack about the AD please understand there's hundreds and thousands of them around the world. And uh, here in the United States and in North America, they're by and large relatively small business guys who are just trying to m justify the expense of in inventory. Same as you would, would do if you had to tie up half of your life's work in inventory that may take quite a while to sell. Date just are us. So um, believe me, they, if, they, if they did not have to uh, wait to get a Batman uh, in your hands, they would be happier about that. Okay, so um, also there are boutiques. Those are actually owned by Rolex. Those are in certain airports around the world. Um, Hong Kong just depends on where you are, but some of the boutiques are, I believe, actually owned by Rolex. And then you have certain authorized dealers, which are chains like Torno. So there are, they may be a lot of them in one city or they may be spread all around the country. And those are essentially corporate owned authorized dealerships. But um, you still have to bear in mind that Rolex in Switzerland is calling the shots in terms of who gets what. No authorized dealer gets to call up Rolex and put in an order the way they do with pretty much any other brand. If you're, a, if you're an authorized dealer for Omega, you can call them up and say, hey, look, I want this many Omega SMP 300s. These are the ones I want in straps. These are the ones that I want in bracelets. Here, I, I, I need two Planet Oceans. Get me a, a Proplof. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's how that works with that brand and with many, many other brands. But with Rolex, you just are obligated to take uh, what they give you. So, um, you know, naturally that puts a great deal of pressure on the authorized dealer. Now, I've spent a lot of time talking about that, but what I really want to kind of get to is the anger that's at the brand. I feel like I'm reading constantly people extremely angry at the brand, but they're angry not with a laser beam at Geneva, which is where this problem originates. If, if there's a distribution problem, believe me guys, it doesn't start at the authorized dealer. Um, it, it starts in Geneva, Switzerland. So if you're angry, that, kind of that's where it should be going. Understand something. If you say you're so angry that you're going to quit that brand and you're going to move on to something else, whether it be Breitling or Grand Seiko or Langa One or Patek, anything, up, up the horological ladder or down, Geneva doesn't care, okay? Rolex doesn't really care. And the reason is we collectors 
we're an odd, we are, we represent, we are a very odd group of people in the sense that we are extremely passionate. We may buy two, three, four of these watches or more. We may flip them around and constantly juggle our money and our different watches. But I don't think that we are the primary target for Rolex Geneva, the manufacturer. I think they are looking for the guy who's going to buy one Rolex when he's uh, 30 and he's made it. Um, he's going to buy one for his wife for their 10th anniversary. And then when he's 50, he's going to buy another one when, because he just became a partner. And uh, th these are their customers. And those people are buying a lot of those date justs that are really all that you and I are seeing in the cases right now. So don't be mad at Rolex. I mean, it's just not worth it. They don't care. I, I feel like it's worth it if you're angry at a brand who is willing to respond to your complaint. Like for example, if you have a bad experience at a family owned restaurant, right? Rather than getting on Yelp and just, you know, bitching and moaning and saying awful things, I feel like if you call the, and, have a, and have a word with the manager, they're gonna do everything they can do to make it right. Because in this day and age, it's, it's hard to replace customers. You know, I was at a chain restaurant. I was at a Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. Wow, those are awesome. If you haven't been and you like steak, you, you should try it. So um, anyway, I'm at, the, I'm at a Ruth's Chris and I ordered a ribeye and I ordered it medium and it, it came medium well to well done, okay? It wasn't burned, but boy, was it overcooked. Now, I'm one of these people, weirdly, I can eat a medium well steak and not complain. That's very rare, very rare, get it? That's a very rare thing, and that's a really bad pun. But I mean, it's a really rare thing, because your average steak lover with a medium well steak would be appalled and would have sent it back at the first bite. You know, and I might have done that too, except for this steak was so, the quality of the meat was so good. It was melting in my mouth, it was delicious. Honestly, I couldn't stop eating long enough to like complain you know about it at all and as you know in, in in a lot of restaurants you know whether it be expensive or inexpensive a lot of times the manager comes around and does what they call a table touch which is they just you know quickly introduce themselves and ask you how everything is going so manager came by for the table touch how's everything guys and i and i said yeah it's, it's good thank you and he, and he i think i must have answered him too without really engaging and he looked at me and he said no really how's everything and I said, well, you know, I, I don't really want to bitch, I guess, but you probably should know what's going on in your kitchen. And I, I cut open my steak, which was, there was only half of it left. And I said, this was ordered medium. And, and his mouth fell open. He said, that's not medium. He goes, that's like, well done. He goes, I'm so sorry. Let me, let me get that off the table and I'll bring you a new one. And I said, no, I'm happy. I'm eating it. It's such a good piece of meat. I'm going to keep going. I like, don't, don't take it. And, uh, and I said, and these, uh, what were what did I else we had ordered um, au gratin potatoes and those damn things now mind you I'm bitching I'm telling you my story about Ruth's Chris but what I can tell you is I've eaten there probably seven or eight times and every other time was like incredible so this was just an off night those potatoes were like crispy raw they, they weren't good and I mentioned that too and he said look those I'm gonna insist I'm getting you new ones because you can't eat these I'll get you new he said and I'm just gonna pack you up a whole new steak um, and you take it to go, which is what he did. So I ate my dinner and then he brought me a whole to go. It was a $45, $50, something like that steak. And he just gave me a whole extra one to have the next day. So I feel like this is how small businesses like authorized dealers, restaurants, you know, family owned where you can talk to the owner of the place. I feel like this is basically how they do want to treat their customers. Um, and until they fall into the clutches of a brand who says you will do this, you won't do that, you have no control, and if you make any trouble, we will yank away your contract and there will go half, half the reason that people come into your store in the first place. So I feel like the authorized dealers are under a great deal of pressure. If you want to be angry at somebody, be angry at Geneva, but understand that they don't care. Now, I'm going to wrap up on this point. You can still buy Rolex. I mean, legitimately, if you have the money and if you're looking to buy Rolex, you can still buy Rolex. I'm a pretty good example. This Submariner, I only acquired it a couple of months ago. I paid $8,500 for it, which is just a tiny bit under MSRP. But uh, because it came from out of state, there was no sales tax. I got it on eBay. So um, a... a if I, had got, if I was able to get this from the authorized dealer, I would have bought it new and it would have cost... 
close to $10,000. So by the time I paid MSRP plus sales tax. So, and this is a box papers set. Now the one that I got is like a 2000, 12 you know so it's not by by no stretch is it new but it, i i got it from a an ebay seller who has 10 low brick and mortar locations in the southern united states like around kentucky and uh so i got a two-year parts and labor uh warranty on this so i'm i'm over the moon i'm really super happy with my watch and it came in nice nicely lightly polished condition uh this um polar explorer um i paid six thousand two hundred dollars for it it was naked it was an orphan no box no papers i was able to easily pretty easily acquire a box for it has no papers it's it was brand spanking new though it still had um a couple of stickers you know on this watch when i bought it so it was essentially unworn i don't know the year because they scramble the serial numbers now but i'm pretty sure this watch when i got it was only a year or maybe two years old um, if I ever really, really want papers on it, well, I'll wait till it's due for a service, send it into Rolex for a service and get back uh, Rolex service papers. But what I did get was I got uh, the AD uh, to give me an insurance appraisal on this. So it's, it's authenticated. And if I ever wanted to sell it, uh, it would be, it would come with that authentication. So I guess what I'm trying to tell you is there are plenty of places where you can still buy a Rolex. If you just can't get one from the authorized dealer, you know, don't be upset. If you have the money and you really want to do this, learn to use eBay, talk to other collectors, be very, very careful on the forums because naturally there could be fraud there, but there are some really terrific, honorable forums and sellers. So you just have to do the research to find those. I made a, a video um, called five ways to buy a used Rolex or something like that. And I will put a link to uh, that video in the description of this one, because I, I feel like I'm having very minimal problem finding Rolex on the used market at very good prices, but I'm a, an informed buyer, I'm a careful buyer, I'm a patient buyer. Now, I'm gonna wrap up on this concept. There are certain watches that are just really, really difficult to get, you know? Uh, those include, like probably the hardest to get right now, I would think, is the, uh, the Daytona. I feel like the ceramic Daytona is super difficult to get. Um, but there are others, you know, the Pepsi GMT on the Jubilee bracelet, the new Batgirl, uh, and there's a couple of other pieces that are just really difficult to get. You know, in the comments of this video, you are going to read lots of people complaining, yeah, these bastards at Rolex, I just they won't give me anything. But you're going to read, for sure I know, because it happens on all of my videos like this, you're going to read stories from certain guys who say, hey, I literally just walked into the AD and uh, and they, and they and one had just come in and they don't do a waiting list at this place and they just sold me my Batgirl. Um, so if you have a problem with uh, acquiring Rolex, if you're angry at the brand. I don't think you should be. I think you're wasting a whole lot of energy, okay? Um, if you wanna just switch brands, that's fine. But guys, there's lots of places to buy Rolex other than the authorized dealer. You don't have to be subject to Rolex's policies if you don't want to. Um, I, I personally, I think it's a good idea for you to try and make a good relationship with an authorized dealer. There's nothing wrong with that. I think that's your best way to go. But if that's not your style, no worries. There's plenty of places to buy a Rolex and I'm gonna tell you exactly how to do that uh, in the video that I have placed into the description. Um, okay, but if you have gotten lucky, if you won the lottery, if you somebody sold you a steel Daytona, tell me how did you get your Rolex, I guess is what I'm saying. Do you have stories of how awful it is to try and buy a Rolex today? Do you have some story where you're like walked into an authorized dealer and re you were able to buy the watch of your dreams in five minutes? I keep hearing stories like both of these in the comments of all my videos. Guys, don't get angry, get even. I would implore you, let's not abandon our beloved brand. Let's just find alternate means to buy the, to, to get the goods. Psht, hey buddy, wanna buy a used Rolex? I gotta tell you, these watches are gonna outlive all of us. Why do you have to have a new one? This is Goldberg, peace out. Paint the sky.